Liverpool are one of the most successful sides in the world of football. With 19 top flight titles, 6 European Cups, 7 FA Cups and more, there are few teams on earth with similar levels of success. But without the actions of one man, they may not have even dreamt of these levels of glory. Bill Shankly was appointed manager of Liverpool in 1959. At the time, they were struggling in the second division of English football. By the time he left, they were a completely different side that had been forever transformed by Shankly. This is the story of Bill Shankly, the man who made Liverpool. Bill Shankly was born on the 2nd of September 1913 in Glenbuck, Scotland. Shankly was the ninth of ten children, and his four brothers would all go on to play football professionally. Glenbuck was a small mining town with a population of only around 700 at the time of Shankly's birth. Shankly struggled with poverty as a child, especially during the winter months, and would often join friends in stealing food and coal to ensure survival. Whilst at school, he would play football at every possible opportunity. He left school at 14 to work in the mines, continuing to partake in football where possible. He would also journey to Glasgow to watch both Celtic and Rangers. After working in the mines for two years, Shankly was left unemployed when the pits closed. However, with all his time playing football, he was only unemployed for a few months before he was signed by 3rd Division North side Carlisle United. It was destined for Shankly, as he always felt he was meant to be a professional footballer and was only killing time in the mines before his true career would begin. His trial at Carlisle was the first ever time that he had left Scotland. He was signed after his trial match, despite Carlisle United reserves losing 6-0. He made his debut for the senior side in December 1932 and would make 16 appearances over the course of the season at right half. He would help them win the North Eastern League Cup as well, with a 1-0 victory over Newcastle Reserves in the final. An offer came in from Preston North End for Shankly at the end of the 32-33 season. Bill Shankly was initially reluctant to sign, feeling that the wages he would be offered were not enough. But his brother Alec pointed out to Bill that joining a second division side would provide him with great opportunities to further his career, and what the move would lead to was more significant than the money he would initially earn. Bill took Alec's advice and signed for Preston North End in 1933. He would make his first team debut in December and helped create a goal in a 5-0 win over Hull City. Shankly quickly established himself in the first team, with a seemingly endless energy and commitment making him a firm fan favourite. Preston were promoted to the first division after finishing in second place. Shankly's place in the team continued to be cemented, and in 1937 they would reach the FA Cup final, but lost 3-1 to Sunderland. The next year, they were back at Wembley, and this time went one better, defeating Huddersfield 1-0, and Shankly had his first major honour. Shankly would also turn out for Scotland on a number of occasions, and was noted for his intense pride when he put on the blue jersey. Unfortunately, like many at the time, Shankly's prime years would be taken away by World War II. Shankly would join the RAF, but also partook in wartime exhibition matches at both club and international level, even turning out for Liverpool in a 4-1 win over Everton. He would also meet his future wife Nessie at the RAF, and they would marry in 1944. Shankly returned to playing for Preston in 1946, but was now 33 and in the twilight of his playing career. By 1949, he had lost his place in the team and had decided he wanted to become a coach. In March of that year, Carlisle United asked Shankly to become their manager and the offer was accepted. Bill Shankly immediately retired from playing to take the job. Whilst Preston resented Shankly's departure, it was a huge step in his career. Carlisle was struggling, still in the 3rd Division North, and had just finished 15th. Shankly took them to a 9th place finish, and then a 3rd place finish after, just missing out on promotion. He would often address the supporters in the stadium before games, telling them about his team selection and his plans for the club. In the 50-51 campaign, season ticket sales were at an all-time high. Sadly, his spell at Carlisle would not end on good terms. Shankly accused the board of not giving his players a bonus that was promised should they finish in the top three. This dispute would lead to Shankly's resignation. Shankly had an unsuccessful interview at Liverpool and would take the job at 3rd Division Grimsby. 
In his first season, they would finish second, missing out on promotion by three points. They would finish in fifth place in his second season. Unfortunately, another dispute with the boardroom would emerge when they didn't provide him with the money to revamp his ageing squad. Shankly resigned in January 1954, owing to the board's lack of ambition. He would join Workington soon after. He transformed the fortunes of Workington too, improving their league position and attendances. Shankly had to perform a great deal of the admin at the club himself, and also expressed concerns about the conditions of the pitch, due to it being shared with the local rugby league club. Shankly would leave Workington in 1955 to work at 2nd Division Huddersfield alongside old friend Andy Beatty. He initially worked as a reserve team coach at Huddersfield and would be promoted to manager after Beatty resigned in 1956. He would give a 16-year-old Dennis Law his debut shortly after taking the reins. Shankly took Huddersfield to a 12th place finish, followed by a 14th place finish the next season. Shankly was frustrated that the board wanted to sell his players without offering money for replacements. He received an approach for his services from Liverpool. Liverpool chairman Tom Williams phoned Shankly and asked him if he'd like to manage the best club in the country, to which Shankly responded, Why? Is Matt Busby packing up? Shankly took time to think about the offer, during which Huddersfield would beat Liverpool 1-0. Shankly resigned from Huddersfield in December 1959 to make the move to Anfield. Liverpool were a club rooted to the second division, and Shankly was stunned at the state they were in. They had recently been knocked out of the FA Cup by non-league Worcester City, Anfield was in disrepair, and Shankly described the training ground Melwood as a shambles. He immediately demanded that £3,000 was spent to improve the stadium. Shankly formed a good working relationship with the backroom staff of Bob Paisley, Joe Fagan and Reuben Bennett, who had helped form the foundation of the legendary Boots Room. Paisley and Shankly worked well together, with Shankly taking the role of motivator and Paisley the tactician. Shankly also formed an immediate bond with the Liverpool supporters, but the same could not be said about the players. Shankly was far from impressed with the players he had, stating, After only one match, I knew that the team as a whole was not good enough. I made up my mind that we needed strengthening through the middle, a goalkeeper, and a centre-half, who between them could stop goals and somebody up front to create goals and score them. As a result, 24 players were placed on the transfer list, all of whom had left within a year. Shankly focused on improving the training facilities for his players. He said one of the training pitches at Melwood looked as though it had been bombed and asked if the Germans had gone over it during the war. The training centre was modernised and he made the players focus on training with the ball rather than long distance running as had been done previously. New recruits came in, including the likes of Scottish duo Ron Yates and Ian St John, and when the board said they couldn't afford the transfers, Shankly responded by saying they couldn't afford not to buy them. Players would also come through the ranks and join the first team, including the likes of Tommy Lawrence, Ronnie Moran and Roger Hunt. After finishing third in consecutive seasons, Liverpool would win the 61-62 second division, with Roger Hunt scoring 41 goals. Liverpool continued to develop, with them finishing 8th in their first season back in the top flight. More players came from the ranks, including Ian Callaghan and Tommy Smith, and Liverpool's hard work would soon pay off. In the 63-64 season, Liverpool won their 6th First Division title, only two years after being promoted. They finished the campaign with a 5-0 thumping of Arsenal, and Shankly had his first major honour at Anfield. Upon being appointed Liverpool manager, Shankly said one of his key aims was to win the FA Cup for the club. Liverpool had never won the FA Cup, losing in the final in both 1914 and 1950. Shankly guided Liverpool to a 1965 FA Cup final, where they would face Don Revy's Leeds. Neither side had ever won the famous trophy before, so it was a chance to make history. Liverpool defender Jerry Byrne played on after breaking his collarbone early in the match, due to substitutions not being in place at the time. Both sides had chances, but Gary Sprake kept Liverpool out and the match remained scoreless. The game would enter extra time. And only three minutes into the extra period, the deadlock was broken. Jerry Byrne crossed the ball into the box and it was headed in by Roger Hunt. Liverpool's lead, however, was short-lived. Eight minutes later, Billy Bremner would equalise for Leeds. Liverpool did not give up, however. They continued to create chances, and their hard work paid off. In the 117th minute, Ian Callaghan crossed the ball into the box, and it was headed in by Ian St John. 
The full-time whistle was blown minutes later, and Liverpool had won the FA Cup for the first ever time. Bill Shankly was delighted with the result, stating, To think a team like Liverpool has never won the FA Cup was unbelievable. So many had prayed for it to happen over the years, but it had never come to pass. So when we beat Leeds, the emotion was unforgettable. He also praised Jerry Byrne for continuing through the pain, saying the defender had played the best game of his life. Upon signing St John and Yates, Shankly said that these two players would win him the FA Cup. Shankly was proven right, as St John had scored the winner, and Yates was the first Liverpool captain to lift the FA Cup. Liverpool were welcomed back to their home city on an open-top bus by a crowd of around half a million people. There was a chance for even more glory, as Liverpool had reached the semi-finals of the European Cup, and the first leg against Inter Milan was three days after the FA Cup final. Liverpool won at Anfield 3-1 and would travel to Italy for the second leg. But in the second leg, Inter would win 3-0 to knock Liverpool out. Shankly was furious, stating that two of the goals should not have been given, a viewpoint many hold to this day. Liverpool would finish 7th the next season, but won the first division again in 1966. They would reach the final of the Cup Winners' Cup, but lost to Borussia Dortmund. Liverpool finished the next season 5th, and Shankly signed a young Emlyn Hughes, a future Liverpool captain. They were knocked out of the European Cup by an Ajax side, with a teenage Johan Cruyff on the field. Liverpool finished third, and then second, over the next couple of seasons, but would not pick up any silverware. In 1970, Liverpool would lose 1-0 to Watford in the quarter-finals of the FA Cup. The defeat was seen as the end for some of Shankly's most prominent players, including Ron Yates, Ian St John, Jerry Byrne, Roger Hunt, and Tommy Lawrence. Shankly had shown perhaps too much loyalty to these players, but now realised they needed to be replaced. He would bring in the likes of Ray Clements, John Toshak, Steve Highway, and Larry Lloyd. Shankly owed a lot of his signings to Chief Scout Jeff Twentyman, who would continue to help provide Liverpool with some of their finest players for many years. Liverpool finished fifth in the league in 1971, and would also reach the FA Cup final against Arsenal. They would narrowly miss out on glory though, thanks to a winner from Charlie George. Despite losing, Liverpool would return home to a rapturous reception, and Shankly addressed the crowd, stating, I have drummed it into my players, time and again, that they are privileged to play for you, and if they didn't believe me, they believe me now. Shankly would then sign a young Kevin Keegan from Scunthorpe United. Liverpool missed out on next season's first division by a single point, with Brian Clough's derby winning the title against all the odds. Liverpool would go one better the next campaign though, winning the 72-73 league title, their first major honour in seven years. They would also reach the UEFA Cup final, where they would face Borussia Mönchengladbach. Liverpool won the first leg at Anfield 3-0, thanks to two goals from Kevin Keegan and one from Larry Lloyd. Mönchengladbach gave Liverpool a scare in the second leg, but could only score twice, and Liverpool won 3-2 on aggregate. After seven years without silverware, Shankly's side had now won a double, and they were keen for more. Liverpool finished second in next season's first division, and were knocked out of the European Cup in the second round, but they would be back at Wembley. Liverpool would face Newcastle in the 1974 FA Cup final, a chance for Shankly to get his second FA Cup as Liverpool manager, and third overall. The result was never in doubt, Liverpool dominated the final, with two goals from Kevin Keegan and one from Steve Highway, sealing their first FA Cup for nine years. Shankly had won his sixth major trophy with the club, and it seemed like his second great team had truly come to life. But soon, Shankly made a decision that would shock the footballing world. On the 12th of July 1974, Liverpool called a press conference, and it was announced that Shankly would step down as Liverpool manager. It was a major shock, and Liverpool fans upon hearing the news believed it was a joke, but sadly, it was the end of the road. Retirement had been something discussed in the Shankly household for a number of years, but Bill was keen to go on. But after winning the FA Cup in 1974, Shankly admitted that he entered the dressing room feeling tired from all the years, and could leave with pride knowing what he had done for Liverpool. Shankly would, however, come to regret the decision. 
Bob Hazy was promoted to manager as his replacement, but Shankly would often turn up to Melwood for the training sessions, and at points would even take over training. Eventually, Bob Paisley had to point out to his former boss that he was no longer the manager, and eventually, Shankly was banned from Melwood. Shankly was unhappy that he was not offered a position at Liverpool's board, but he continued to be involved with football in any way possible. He gave advice to upcoming managers, and would often take part in five-a-side football. Shankly had given everything he could to the game, and admitted later that this had an effect on his family, something that he deeply regretted. Brian Clough paid tribute to Shankly upon the Scotsman's retirement, stating, He's a one-off. There'll never be another one like Shanks. Never at all. He absolutely lives the game. He was totally honest. He believed implicitly in what he was doing, and there was never, ever a doubt. When you talked to him, met him, or anything, he was above board. He was above board. He was one-off. Shankly had given his whole life to football, and nothing sums up his love for the game better than when he said, Somebody said that football's a matter of life and death to you. I said, listen, it's more important than that. Bill Shankly dies on the 29th of December 1981, at the age of 68. His passing resulted in a huge outpouring of grief. The Labour Party held a minute's silence in honour of Shankly, and Matt Busby was so upset, he refused to take any phone calls, asking for his reaction. On the first game at Anfield after Shankly's death, a banner was held in a cop, saying, Shankly lives forever. In 1982, the Shankly gates were cast in front of Anfield, with the words, You'll never walk alone, inscribed on them. Nessie Shankly would open these gates in a ceremony. And in 1997, a statue of Bill Shankly was placed outside Anfield, with the inscription, He made the people happy. Bill Shankly will forever be an icon of football. He understood what the game meant better than anyone, devoting his entire life to it, and in return won many honours as a reward for his dedication. He never lost a common touch, and was always there for fans, making it clear to his players that it was their job to make the fans happy and in return, Liverpool fans would see Shankly as a god. There is not a figure more important to the history of Liverpool than Bill Shankly. Without him, they could well have remained in the second division, and never added to the five league titles they had before his reign. The motion Shankly set in place at Liverpool continued long after his retirement, with both Bob Paisley and Joe Fagan taking what they had learned from Shankly and guiding Liverpool to European Cup wins. Bill Shankly is unquestionably one of the greatest managers of all time. Without him, football would be a very different game. His love for football, combined with hard work and dedication, showed the world what the beautiful game was all about. And in a modern world, where football is becoming more and more detached from the fans, we could do with Bill Shankly to show what football truly means. <laughs>